Grace and Peace, welcome to Judas Roar Domestic Violence Awareness Initiative YouTube channel. I am your host, Apostle Cheryl L. Richardson. Today's topic is going to be that all abuse is not physical and all wounds are not visible. All abuse is not physical and all wounds are not visible. Now, before we get started, I'm going to give you a few seconds. Subscribe. Look down there. there. Tap that subscribe button. And once you've done that, click on the bell for notifications. And that way you will be alerted every time we upload a new weekly video, which typically occurs on Sundays at 4 p.m. Central Time and 5 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Okay, let's get to it. Are you struggling? Are you struggling? Are you trying to figure out if the relationship that you have committed yourself to, the relationship that you are currently involved in, or even a previous relationship is abusive? Let me begin by saying that if this is a question in your mind even, then that's very telling. And it's an indicator that there's something occurring in the relationship that doesn't coincide with your understanding of what a healthy relationship should look like, okay? And so oftentimes victims struggle with this. They, they are not sure if they're in an abusive relationship or not. And this is particularly difficult for victims if things have not escalated to a place where physical aggression is taking place. Physical aggression is, 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 is the one indicator that most people recognize as domestic violence. But there is a plethora of other behaviors, other actions, other forms of maltreatment that are typically present long before things escalate to where sexual assault or physical assault is actually taking place. So here are some of the things that I want you to look at listen for, pay attention, you know, do, do a self inventory, do an introspection, uh, pick a relationship that, that you were in in the past, or even look at your current relationship. And here are the things that you want to be sensitive to if they are in fact occurring in your relationship. All right, we've got 14 things. You ready? All right, let's go. Number one, is there blaming or cursing or name calling? Blaming, cursing, or name calling. In order for an abuser to feel confident and comfortable in their abuse of the victim, they have to first dehumanize them. They must be dehumanized, right? Reduce you to less than a human being with a right to be treated fairly and justly. So one of the primary things that an abuser will seek to do is to dehumanize the victim. Blaming, cursing, name calling, stripping the victim, of their identity and of their confidence and of their sense of self. And so that's key, number one. Number two, do both parties have input regarding the finances in the relationship or in the household? Do both parties have a voice concerning the finances, okay? If you have no voice concerning the finances in the home, then that is indicative of financial abuse. Now, here's another side note regarding financial abuse. It can take many, many different forms, okay? Did you know that if a woman makes 65% or more of the household income, that she is more likely to be subjected to domestic violence? If a woman makes more than 65% of the household income, 
And that can be because the partner does not work at all and commandeers her paycheck every time she gets one. Or it could be that the partner works and does not um, make as much as his partner, his female partner. Okay, so that's a very interesting statistic. Um, does your partner seem to have two or more sides, two or more personalities? There's more than one person living in there. Does it feel like that? Does it feel like you're, you're always concerned about which one you're actually interacting with at any given time? Do you find yourself praying that the other one doesn't show up? Okay. Does your partner seem to have more than one personality, more than one side, more than one persona? Think about it. Do you find yourself, do you find yourself making excuses for their horrible behavior? Do you find yourself making excuses for their behavior when they offend others, uh, when they are rude and obnoxious or denigrating? Do you feel compelled to explain and to soften it for the recipients? Do you make excuses for their behavior? Well, bad day at work. Well, dropped on their head at birth. Well, father left when he was two. Well, he just got terminated from his job. Well, he just went on an interview and they didn't hire him. Do you find yourself making excuses for unacceptable, inexcusable behavior? Okay. Now, this video is going to call for some introspection. It's going to call for some soul searching. And it's going to call for some honesty. And I'm a firm believer in this. You should always tell yourself the truth, for sure. You should always tell yourself the truth. Okay. Number five. Are you experiencing isolation from friends or family or coworkers? Are there limits placed on the frequency of your interaction with others outside of the relationship? Are you being told that there are certain people that you are not permitted to have a friendship with? You're not permitted to speak with them. You're not permitted to socialize with them. Okay. If any of that's happening, that's a red flag. Okay. Does one person in the relationship make all of the decisions, no matter what they are? No matter what they are, one person is deciding everything all of the time, right? There is an imbalance of power in the relationship. And one person holds all of the power and all of the decision-making ability within that relationship. That's a red flag. Are there threats? Are you feeling intimidated? And listen, listen, a threat doesn't have to be a verbal threat. A threat can be a facial expression. A threat can be a sound that is uttered. A threat can be issued simply using body language, right? A threat can look like someone wandering through the house wielding a weapon of some sort. Okay, and so it doesn't have to be, I'm going to punch you in the face. It doesn't have to be, I'm going to kill you. Nonverbal cues can be used to send these very same messages in ways that the victim knows what they are. Other people, if they're paying attention, may pick up on it. But did you know, did you know that a threat can be uttered in such a way that it doesn't appear to be a threat to bystanders, but the victim is clear that a threat has been communicated, okay? Tone of voice, the inflection in the voice can be used. 
Are you afraid to express your own opinions? This is number eight. You have an opinion, right? You have an opinion. You even know what your opinion is, but you are terrified of expressing it because of the foolishness that ensues when you do. So are you hesitant? Are you anxious about expressing your own opinion? This one might be a little touchy. Number nine, do you feel pressured somehow, whether it is overt or whether it is covert? Do you feel pressured to have an intimate relations with your partner? Do you feel pressured to do it? Do you understand that this is the expectation and it really doesn't matter how you feel about it, okay? And as a side note, sexual assault can also occur within a marital relationship. It's important to know that. It's important to know that being married to an individual does not eliminate them uh, in terms of committing sexual assault, okay? Number 10 were either your parents or your partner's parents abusive? Were your parents or your partner's parents abusive? Number 11, are your expectations for yourself or others unreasonable? Now listen, this is important. Are your expectations for yourself or others reasonable. Now, listen carefully. When I talk about reasonable expectations, I'm not talking about what we as human beings have a right to expect from other human beings. I'm not talking about what is politically correct. I'm not talking about etiquette. That's not what I'm talking about. When I ask about reasonable expectations, I am talking about this. Is there any evidence to support your belief that you can expect a certain kind of behavior from a partner? Have they ever treated you appropriately in the past? How do they treat others that they interact with? And so if our expectation is that an abusive person will not conduct themselves in an abusive manner, the reality of it is, there's probably little to no evidence to support that they are both able and willing to do so. Number 12, does your partner use coercive control tactics such as hostile humor, ignoring you, withholding affection, belittling you, publicly or privately, as a means of gaining control over you and keeping you in line. Number 13, does personal property get destroyed within your home? Do your things get smashed or broken? Do they disappear when things aren't going well within the relationship? And then number 14, does your partner control you with a look or a tone of voice, a certain saying, a facial expression? Do you find yourself responding to their body language as much as you respond to what they actually verbalize? And so what have we been talking about? We've been talking about the fact that all abuse is not physical and all wounds are not visible. We've touched on 14 different things that you can consider um, as you examine your own relationship, as you examine a previous relationship that, that you may have had questions about. But it's important that we know what to look for. And it's important that we understand that all 
coercive control tactics. All of these various forms of manipulation, whether it be financial abuse, verbal abuse, emotional abuse, spiritual abuse, all of these different forms of abuse are in fact domestic violence. The violence begins long before physical aggression manifests itself within the confines of that relationship. This is Apostle Cheryl L. Richardson with Judas Roar Domestic Violence Awareness Initiative. We hope that this broadcast has helped you to identify the various ways that domestic violence can present in a relationship. Blessings to you.